No Marines are in our presence today, therefore you can make sure your wallet is still with you. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Air Force. We have no Coast Guardsmen or Merchant Mariners. March time. March. Colors. Hope. Left. Face. Present. Arms. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. song today is Kate Smith. <laughs> uh, roughly a year or so ago, it was during the centennial, I had occasion to have lunch with uh, past president John Zimmerman. And we were at the time uh, talking about General Devers. And John shared with me, you know, he said, General Devers spoke to the Rotary Club when I was the president. And I was very excited to learn this. And as is my custom, I immediately attempted without follow-up investigation of any kind, to plan to use said audio for a Veterans Day program. It took some time, took some coaxing, convincing, and conjoling, but the program committee apprehensively was agreeable to my plan, but there was one problem. No one knew where said recording might be. I, of course, went straight to Bert, who laughed and said, yeah, I know exactly where an audio recording from 1974 is. <laughs> I then did some asking at the uh, York County uh, History Center and uh, also got a distinct level of perplexity. But uh, happily, uh, Joan Lummert and uh, June Lloyd recommended to me, ask Rich Robinson. He knows more about what we have on General Devers than we know. And so, a very bad pun would be, the rest, as they say, is history. But in any case, I'm off the hook, and we have a wonderful speaker. Rich Robinson is, not surprisingly, a history major from Pace, as well as a master's in history from NYU. He is currently the uh, director of the Penoir organization, uh, was previously a member of this club, and was previously on the York Suburban School Board. Uh, Rich is uh, examining the papers of General Devers and has been for several years and is currently in the process of writing a book about the general from York Street, General Jacob L. Devers. So it's with great pleasure and anticipation that I invite Rich Robinson to speak to you. start that we might be rushed for time because there's so much in General Devers' life to condense into a few minutes. So for those of my colleagues from Penmar who are here today, I'm going to amaze them because I came up with a tweet. 
and they will tell you that I am the most technologically inept person on the planet. But here we go with the tweet. This will give you the short version. Jake Devers was from York, PA. He was a general in World War II. There was a lot of fighting. Stuff got blown up. We won. It was pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there's more to it than that. But before we get into that, I would like to thank a few folks here and elsewhere. But first of all, I would like to thank Ken Cooper for all the work he did on the audiovisual today. Some of you in the club may remember a time when I was responsible for the audiovisual during the presentation and the screen went black for the entire presentation. I'd also like to thank the Rotary Club for having me here. And I'd like to say a special word of thanks to all of the veterans and to their families. I think we often overlook the sacrifices that the families of our veterans make. And if it's anything that's come home to me in studying the papers of General Devers and the letters between General Devers and Mrs. Devers, it's the sacrifices that family members make, all of their loved ones, in giving up their loved ones to the service of our country. So thank you to all veterans, your families, to all of you on active duty, to all of you who will be on active duty, and to your families and loved ones who do so much for us. I'd also like to thank Joan Mummer and her incomparable colleagues at the York History Center. I don't want to mention any names, but their initials are Lila Foreman Shaw, June Lloyd, and Amanda Evler. Uh, we have an incomparable resource in the York History Center in their archive, and the staff are second to none, in my view. And this being York, I'm sure that there are some relatives of General Devers in the audience. I know Brad Jacobs is here. Brad, where are you? There, we have at least one, there are probably more. So, thank you for being relatives of General Never. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do... I was there for him. <laughs> what I would like to do is start off just briefly with a few words about the General, and then we're going to give you a short clip from the speech he made to the club in 1974 in just a moment, and we're also going to have a short film clip so that you can get an idea of what he looked like. Because he is one of these guys that is, is a shadow figure in history. Nobody really knows that much about him, and they have to go looking for him. But Al actually asked me one time, why is Devers important? And I think the answer to that is pretty clear, especially in view of the national ordeal of the past 18 months that has just concluded, some of us may be asking ourselves, are public figures always like this? And I would say the answer is no. And there is no better example of a true officer and gentleman than Jacob Devers. He was always gallant, always courteous, and always fair to colleagues with whom he served even though many of those colleagues insulted him and slighted him both during and after the war. And Jacob Devers never responded in kind. He was always gracious and always gallant, especially in commenting on men like George S. Patton, a classmate of his at West Point, but more of that later. So if we may, Ken, let's start with the, the speech clip. This was in 1974. General Devers was 87 years old. And he's talking about his service as a young lieutenant in Wyoming. Ken? Every, every part of body that's had the experience that you have, all you got to do is go out, live on your moral principles, get in the, the, the brain to go around there in a small group, find out what they're thinking, and then do it. Don't join a committee of 40 or 50 of them to listen for hours and perfectly well on who the damn comments around in the papers and mean something that you didn't mean. Uh, you avoid all that. And I have a typical example in the disciplinary line that, uh, that I learned as a second lieutenant of Cheyenne, Wyoming. That's a rough country. <clears throat> we had plenty of Indians, and there's an Indian from Arizona here today, but we had plenty of Indians at our rodeos. And I used to race with polo ponies. Blues out there with them in the frontier days. 
And uh, <clears throat> we had a, one fine theater in the Middle West, it was in Cheyenne. And all the good children from Chicago always stopped off of there on the Union Pacific before they went west. And all the young bucks from Fort D.A. Uh, Russell would get down and take the young girls out before they were going west, and the, the train generally started late. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we, in, in those early days of my career, everybody drank too much. The officers drank too much, the enlisted men drank too much. And the drug today is liquor. I, I'm not a prohibition, I drink liquor, but you don't drink too much of it. And it was then. And on payday, we had expert horseshoers, we had expert mechanics, we had expert saddlers. Uh, we carried those trays in the army. But on payday, uh, the morning after, there were very few people around. And I don't mean in these skills, but I mean there to groom those mules. Now, I'm a second lieutenant, and those mules have to be groomed. So, uh, customary uh, to give them one day, and then they appointed the Jake Devers and a committee of three to go downtown and round up all these from 11th Infantry, the 9th Cavalry, which was colored. So, we had that problem and the 4th Mountain Artillery. And we were big and tall and rough. <coughs> They're taller than me, I said. But we were generally over six feet. Well, I've never been in those kind of houses. <laughs> <laughs> I never knew what these drunks did in those bar rooms. I just saw them from my front porch, where my mother used to say, as they both walked by and walked there on a Sunday, or weekday or late around four o'clock while we're waiting for the father to come home. There'd be a couple staggered by there going west. And uh, uh, she'd uh, start smoking a cigarette and she'd say, there they go. Another nail in their coffin, another nail in their coffin. And boy, I never got rid of that nail in the coffin. It always comes up and it's true. Well, uh, uh, so I, I was the smallest and the people that generally didn't get this way and I had to tell my details were just about my height. So I used to say that it was young brother, now you get behind me when they throw me out the door and just catch me. And then I scared to death. No doubt about it. I'm scared to death as I've ever been, even in Bible. I know what's going on, but I never knew when I opened that door what was going to happen. I opened that door and I walk in and I yell at this great voice they gave me here in New York. Uh, attention, you know. There's always a half front sergeant in there said, You heard what the lieutenant said. And he begin to help me, and then I'd get other help. So we'd drag him out, pull him out of our arms, walk him out, take money out of their pocket, get them on the street cars, or put them in a, a wagon and haul them home and deliver, deliver them to the regiment. Well, to make a long story short, with my man, I, I had a first sergeant meet me at a certain point. And I turned them all over to him. And I said to him, Sergeant, you take these fellows right over to the barracks, and you get their chief section out, and you kick their heads in that water and trough until they're sober. <laughs> and keep ducking them. And then see if they dry it off, they don't get sick, and put them to bed, because we need manpower the next morning. Now I say, paperwork, I don't have that 50 pages of briefs to lawyers right now. <laughs> <laughs> and that's who General Devers was, especially in commenting on how you handle your detail to get your men back into action. That characterized his conduct throughout his career. He was considered one of the best fast action executives in the Army, and we'll go into that in a few minutes. What I'd, also, what I'd like to do now is, is show you a short film clip from a film called The Welcome to Britain. And this was filmed in 1943 by American and British film crews to help GIs learn a little bit more about the country where they were landing, England. Because the customs of the British and the customs of the Americans weren't quite in sync. You know what I mean? Really? <laughs> yeah. I know this comes as news to you. Really? Yeah. 
So in that sense, you're going to see General Devers for just a few minutes, but what I want you to really watch is his face, especially if you've seen the movie Patton. Ken, can we have the clip? As you can all see, this film worked brilliantly. There were amiable relations between the British and the Americans coming in, right? Of course. Okay, we'll move right along on that one. What, it, what I really want to point out, though, is that this guy couldn't stop smiling for love or money throughout his life. He actually got demerits at West Point for smiling on the drill field. His drill instructor always thought he was laughing at it. And, and Devers was always noted for his smirk and his grin. But now let's go back to York in the 1880s. Let's go back to York. In the 1880s, around the time Jacob Devers was born, this is what the town looked like. He knew it briefly. But you know, in the old days, biographers always used to write about momentous events when great men were born. A comet would cross the sky. There'd be a total eclipse of the sun or tidal waves. Here's what happened in and around York on September 8, 1887, when Jacob Devers was born. Mr. Felix Bensel reported that persons or persons unknown raided his spring house of butter and sausages, besides upsetting things generally. A prized alderney cow belonging to State Senator Gerard Brown of Yorkana returned home after being absent for several days, <laughs> missing part of its tail. Foul play was suspected until the copra was identified as a briar bush. Now clearly from those signs we learn that General Devers was obviously destined for a brilliant military career. <laughs> now the town was changing. This is what York looked like 18 years later when he left for West Point. 
It was a time of tremendous growth and influenced him greatly as a youth because throughout his life he always felt of his growing up in York that if you gave people a decent place to live, a good job, and enough to feed their families and clothe their families, that was proof against any kind of totalitarianism. Now this is Jake at 16, around the time he's thinking of going to West Point. But his school career almost came to an abrupt end when he entered with a bunch of friends from Garfield School. He entered York High the first day and was summarily thrown out by Professor McClowry. And he and his friends went over to the Soldiers and Sailors Monument to talk things over, wondering what they were going to do, telling their folks that they were thrown out of high school before the first period began. They delegated Jake Devers to go back and beg Professor McClowry to let them back in, and he did. Although he may later have lamented this decision because this group was strongly suspected of releasing a flock of pigeons in the school auditorium during an exercise. <laughs> now incidentally, Jake Devers' father, Philip, raised pigeons on West York Avenue. I make no inferences there. But at 16, Jake Devers was worried about one thing and one thing particularly. He didn't think he spoke very well. He didn't think he communicated well. Which is ironic because he was elected president of the debating society. But throughout his life, he always doubted his ability to communicate. And I think this influenced a lot of people who knew him later in life and disliked him because they thought through his manner of communication he wasn't very smart. And he knew this, and it bothered him all his life. He, as an old man, he actually said one time, it's always bothered me, and it does to this day, that I have a very defeatist complex with reference to English. I advise everybody to concentrate on that. And he always felt it very deeply. Now, he went to West Point in 1905. Okay, I'm going the wrong way. But running up to the appointment, there was another problem brewing. Because Jake, Jake Devers' father was not a Republican. He was a Democrat in New York City. And when appointments were being made, Congressman Dan Lafine was looking for a likely candidate and did not pick Jake Devers first. He picked a young man named David Long. David Long's father was a minister and told his son he didn't raise him to be a soldier and asked him to turn the appointment down. And David Long did. Well, this sent Dan Lapine into orbit because none of his appointments had ever done very well at West Point. They washed out, they were found, they didn't make it. And he felt that very deeply. And when David Long announced that he was going to turn down this appointment, Dan Lapine said to his aide, Sam Lewis, by heaven I'd appoint the devil himself if he'd just take this appointment. Now Sam Lewis's brother Milton lived across the street from the Devers. And they knew Jake was a pretty good student, and he was a really great athlete here in town. So Sam Lewis said to Congressman Dan Lafine, Congressman, I might be able to help you with this. Instead of the devil, how about the son of a registered Democrat? <laughs> and Dan Lafine responded by saying, sure, what's the difference? <laughs> and Jake got the appointment. He went to West Point in 1905, graduated in 1909, 39th in his class. Several places ahead of his classmate, George S. Patton. Patton was always very conscious of this fact. He was a very competitive guy. Now we're going to skip through the rest of Devers' career through the 20s and 30s, except to say that he chose the field artillery as his branch and helped make U.S. field artillery second to none. I know in military history, a lot of armchair historians especially, myself being one of them, always look at the Germans and say, these guys are the standard by which everyone else should be judged. Not so with the field artillery. American field artillery was incomparable. And going forward, when you read histories of World War II, I would ask you to take note of how many attacks by opposing forces were broken up by American guns. I think you'll be impressed by the result. Now, in 1939, September 1st, the Germans invade Poland. That same day, George Marshall is appointed Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. He was one of the most formidable Chiefs of Staff on record. Made it a point never to laugh at Franklin Roosevelt's jokes. And he could be a ruthless man 
when it came to picking and dismissing subordinates. To other men that enter our story, Dwight Eisenhower and Omar Bradley. Eisenhower had been a staff officer for most of his career, serving a great many years under D Douglas MacArthur. And many historians feel this actually prepared Eisenhower to handle the likes of Winston Churchill. Eisenhower once said of his experience with MacArthur, yes, it was a great study in dramatics. <laughs> and then we have Omar Bradley. Bradley was a very interesting figure in that he carefully cultivated his image as a very simple, plain-spoken man from Missouri. <laughs> he always wanted to project the demeanor of a humble man or the country parson who proudly announced that the bake sale realized $12.50 more than anticipated. <laughs> Bunk. Omar Bradley was a tightly wrapped, egotistical, ruthless soldier. He dismissed more men in the European theater than Patton ever dreamed of. And he could also be very vindictive. Now, as the war is getting closer to us, Marshall realizes we're going to be in it. And we better start developing tanks. Because it, when he took over as chief of staff, the U.S. Army did not have one credible tank division to take the field. As a matter of fact, we really didn't have any credible tanks. He appointed a man named Adna Chaffee to get this program going. But Adna Chaffee was dying of brain cancer, and this program was going nowhere fast. He sent Jake Devers down to look it over and see what was going on. Devers came back and gave his report, told him why things were going nowhere fast. Marshall thought it over. Now, everybody in the Army thought George Patton was going to get it. He was a cavalryman, and he felt that tanks should be horses with bogey wheels. The infantry, on the other hand, thought tanks should be moving machine gun nests. Much to everyone's surprise, George Marshall picked Jake Devers, a gunner, to oversee tank development in the United States. And he did an outstanding job and put tanks in the field faster than anybody thought imaginable. He did it in a space of two years. The British were having trouble getting a credible tank in the field in far more time than that. One of the reasons he was able to do that is his superior officer was a man named Leslie McDare, and they had served together in the 4th Mountain Artillery when they were young lieutenants. And as I said, Devers developed the Sherman tank. He also developed self-propelled artillery so that the guns could move with the tanks. And he was the driving force between, behind the DUKW, which was a supply vehicle that probably influenced more tight spots than any other truck or cargo ship of record. Now, he went to North Africa in 1943 to find out what was going on, learn from the British that they loved the Sherman tank. And as he came back, his plane crashed in Ireland. Now, the German ambassador to Ireland was oddly enough on his way to check on his spies on the west coast, I suppose, and saw what was going on. And the German embassy got a cable from Berlin to ask what had happened and wrote back that Devers had actually escaped to England. The Germans were very upset by that because by that time in 1943, they recognized him as one of the foremost tank experts in the American Army. But in 1943, he was pulled from tank development and sent to England at a time when the Americans and the British were arguing bitterly over the direction of the war. Field Marshal Sir Alan Brooke and Winston Churchill wanted us to attack Italy, the soft underbellies underbelly so-called. The Americans were holding firm for the cross-channel invasion. And Devers was sent there at a time when there were very few Americans to really defend the American position. And the Italian invasion went forward. Now at this time, Devers was working closely with Lewis Mountbatten, who was helping him develop amphibious warfare techniques, and General Ira Aker of the 8th Air Force at a time when the 8th Air Force was being shot to pieces over the skies of Europe. And De Devers was doing all he could to help the air effort succeed, because at that time we were losing. 
and we were losing badly. And he defended Acre as best he could to no avail, because when the final decisions were made for the invasion of Europe, both Jake Devers and Ira Acre were sent to Italy. At the time they got to Italy, things were really pretty bad between the Americans and the British. The man on the upper left, standing behind the big rotund man, is a man named Oliver Lees. He was at odds with Mark Clark. Actually came to his headquarters one day after it had been bombed accidentally by the Americans. A second time. <laughs> Got Mark Clark on the radio and said, Mark, yes, yeah, all you hear. No, no one killed no boy. Listen, we haven't done anything to annoy you chaps lately, have we? <laughs> no, no, jolly good. Better luck next time. When Jake Devers arrived, he had to contend with a prima donna like Mark Clark, Sir Harold Alexander, but worked very well with the theater commander, Sir Henry Wilson, called Jumbo Wilson because he weighed 300 pounds. Got there just in time for Anzio, the brainchild of Winston Churchill. This operation was a disaster, but I think it gave Jake Devers the learning curve he needed when he commanded the 6th Army Group for the invasion of southern France. Churchill was vehemently opposed to the invasion of southern France and fought it every step of the way. He predicted that it would take the Allied forces from southern France six months to get off the beaches and get up into France proper. With a team of Alexander Patch, Kent Hewitt of the Navy, and Jean de Latre of the French Army, the 7th Army and the 1st French Army was able to land in southern France and take Toulon and Marseille in 10 days. In 30 days they were linked up with Patton in France and advancing toward Germany. Now that red square is the scene of the hottest action in Europe at the time, in, December, in November of 1944, when the Americans of the 7th Army under Devers arrived on the Rhine, and they arrived there to stay. And this was really the precursor to one of the most dramatic incidents of the war, in my view, because if you see those red arrows at the bottom, the 6th Army group, the 7th Army, and the 1st French Army are the only ones who are moving forward. And they're ready to cross the Rhine in late November of 1944. Eisenhower and Bradley come down to stop it. And they stopped him cold. And for the rest of his life, Jake Devers believed that if he had been permitted to cross the Rhine in late November of 1944, the bulge, the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes Forest never could have taken place because we would have had troops on the east side of the river. We were bounced a few weeks later at the Bulge, and at that time, Eisenhower ordered Devers to pull back from Strasbourg, a key city in France, and Devers refused. He dragged his feet, and Eisenhower was getting ready to fire him, and Devers tried to, to begged him not to do it because he knew the French would not follow the order. And luckily, through the intercession of Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt, Eisenhower relented. The war was rapidly coming to a close. And I'd like to make special note of the town that's being liberated on the upper left. The pronunciation of this town's name, the spelling is actually B-I-T-C-H-E. It's pronounced Beach. It was liberated by the men of the 100th Division after some very heavy fighting. And the French were very happy about that. And they proclaimed that soldats Americans say, Je vous et aux fils de beach. Soldiers Americans, this day you are all sons of beach. <laughs> <laughs> well, the guys in the 100th Division loved that, and they went around starting to call themselves the sons of beach. As a matter of fact, the 100th is still an active division, and they still do. <laughs> the war ended, Jake Devers came home, and he was appointed to command the Army Ground Forces. Now, at this time, the Air Force was declared an independent entity, and all the Air Force generals wanted intercontinental bombers. 
Jake Devers was the first man in the American Armed Forces to realize the potential of the helicopter. And if it had not been for him, Army aviation would have been stalled for years to come. He retired in 1949 and spent the rest of his life in and around Washington, D.C. In closing, I would just like to relate an episode that was shared with me by Jack Meeker, who was a prisoner of war in the closing months of the war. He was there one day when he heard GIs calling out, hey, there are Yanks coming through the front gate. He went to see what was going on. There was a four-star general walking toward him. He said, my God, I have no idea who this guy is. The man put his arm on his shoulder, said, Lieutenant, I want to know all about this. Meeker explained what was going on and then asked what he could do for the lieutenant. Meeker had been in the Army for about four years and said, this is the only time a four-star general is ever going to ask me what I want. Easter's a week away. He said, General, I want to be in, East in Paris for Easter. This general looked at him and said, I think that's a good idea. I want all these men in Paris for Easter. The colonel standing next to him winced and said, General, for God's sake, you have no idea what you're asking. I got to round up at least 100, 150 ambulances. They're all going to be going against traffic. It can't be done. Never smiled, or the general smiled. Said, Colonel, I understand your problem. Let me rephrase. I want all these men in Paris for Easter. That's an order. <laughs> I had to ask Jack Meeker what he thought about this. And his response was instantaneous. I didn't know we had such men in our army. Patton never would have done anything like that. I just didn't know we had such men. I don't think it's an accident that that four-star general was Jacob Devers, and it's surely not an accident he was from York, Pennsylvania. Thank you very much for listening. Mark time. Mark. Colors. Pulp. Right. Face. Present. Arms. Order. Arms. Post. Present. Arms. Order. Arms. Right, face, forward, march. 